the black holes are probably the most remarkable thing in this universe. Uh, ultimate curvature of space-time, infinite densities, light can't escape, all sorts of horizon problems, information. Uh, absolutely fascinating. A, 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 a test bed for all the theories of, uh, of uh, fundamental physics. You've gone one step further. You've hypothesized that black holes can somehow become the mother of future universes. How is that possible? First, let me say that's not my idea. That's an idea that I learned from my teachers, from Bryce DeWitt, from John Wheeler. It's one of the oldest ideas in the subject of quantum gravity, that when you take quantum mechanics into effect, the singularity at the end of the evolution of the star that collapses to a black hole when everything becomes infinitely dense and time stops is removed and time continues. Now, wh where does time continue to? And the most natural point of view is that time continues to a new region of space and time. Since space and time is dynamical and is created by evolution, you create a new region of space and time which can't be perceived from the original reason, region because of the horizon of the black hole. So that's an old idea that the horizon of a black hole, when you go through the horizon of a black hole, you then would hit the singularity according to classical general relativity, but quantum effects would remove the singularity so you could keep going. And then you get a new baby universe, a new region of space and time. Similarly, the cosmological singularity the speculation was you mean at the beginning at of the, the beginning of space and time, time in classical general relativity before the big bang or right at the big bang at yeah. the big bang that the speculation has been for decades that quantum effects would remove that and there would therefore be a time before the big bang and let me say since i started publishing about this the mathematical evidence is much stronger that is we have much more control of the kind of calculations in the quantum theory of gravity that we need to do to study these events where singularities are replaced. And work of the last six, seven years, not by myself, but by a number of people in the field, has shown that one always gets, in a large class of, the, of models of these events, one always gets a bounce and a region before the Big Bang or region after the black hole singularity. So there's good, there's not a proof, but there's good theoretical reason to believe that this is really what happens. Okay. Now, the next idea is that what's to the future of the black hole singularity when time ended, okay, is the creation of a new universe. And the new idea is that that might look like our universe. That is, it might be as symmetrical as the beginning of our universe seems by observation to have been. That there's less theoretical evidence for, but it's also an old speculation, and one can, one can see that it might be true. One can take it on board as a theoretical idea. Now, John Wheeler, who was, in a sense, the, one of the great inspirations for the modern work on quantum gravity, in the 1960s was already speculating that the laws of nature change at such events. He called it reprocessing the universe. And there was already in his work some suggestion of some analogy to biology, which was an inspiration for myself and for people in my generation. The natural selection of biology. He didn't really refer directly to natural selection. Um, but there was a sort of hint in the language that he chose. And what I did, and this is the only part which was my input, was I realized that if the laws change just a little bit, just like on the average generation to generation in biology in a species, the genes change just a little bit. You don't get a radically different right, creature right. when you have a child. Okay. Then there could be natural selection. Then there could be accumulation of positive and negative selection okay. by having more or less progeny. And that's what I added. That okay, let me, let me try to understand this picture, and I want to divide it into two parts. I want to do everything up to the generation of a new universe through black holes, and then I want to talk about the natural selection and the, what that could mean for the changing. So those are two separate things, and as you yes. the latter being your, 
yes. particular contribution. But let, let, let's understand all coming up to you. You threw a lot at me, and I want to be sure I, I, I got it. First of all, in the center of black holes and at the beginning of the universe, we have something called the singularity, which is ultimate curvature of space-time, ultimate density, the time infinite. stops, in, 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 infinite, infinite uh, density and time stop, all, all, all things that we, infinities of galore, yes. and we c can't deal with that. And that's general relativity. And yes. what you're saying that quantum mechanics, if you put that in there, eliminates that problem because of the wave function and the probabilities of quantum mechanics, so you can somehow break through that because of the probabilities of quantum mechanics. It's not a discrete thing. And so that, that, that's how quantum mechanics brings you beyond the singularity, in both mm -hmm. cases, black hole yes. and, and early universe. Yes. Okay, so now we're saying since the two singularities seem to be the same, maybe there's something that one can cause the other, and now you're adding the point that if if the laws of nature can slight even slightly change even no it has to be slightly uh, okay if the laws can maybe slightly change at that moment then there can be a selection effect and this is where your idea comes in now we yes. want to find out how that would work and what that would mean yes because if you imagine now a population of universes growing, there's one each time there's a black hole in our universe. So if the laws change slightly at that event, one gets a large number, it's about a billion billion is what we expect in our universe, black holes. So one gets a billion times a billion universes, which are very similar to ours. 10 to the 18. 10 to the 18, okay. Now let's suppose there's another universe which has a different set of laws that only makes a handful of universes. Then each of those is very close to that, so they're likely also to only make a handful. So, um, so after several generations, there's a vast number of ones like ours, and there's a small number of others. Just works just like natural selection in biology. Therefore, one could explain, if one therefore imagines after a long time goes by, almost every universe in that population has the property that its parents had a lot of ch children. Right. Because it's much more likely to be the child of a chain of descendants that had lots of children sure, than that sure. had few. Okay. So that leads to an explanation for why are the laws of physics the way they are? Why are the masses of the different particles the way they are? Because they're extremized to produce lots of black holes. And it leads remarkably to definite predictions, predictions for present and future observations. And just so it's on the table, I'll mention one, I won't go through the chain of reasoning for it, that there are no neutron stars with a mass more than 1.6 times the mass of the sun. Turns out by a certain chain of reasoning to be a prediction of this. You can argue if there were, then there would have been a way to make more black holes in our universe. So universes that have more black holes will then give rise to, to universes that have still more black yes. holes. So if, if this process continues forever, what, what is, is, there, is, is there an asymptote? That, or it, it, it seems like it would just populate all black holes, ultimately. Well, so I don't know what forever means, but I'm very happy with a long time, uh, okay. with many generations. Right, right. And... The conclusion is that, again, just like biology, that a typical universe will be very fit. That is, if you change the laws slightly in almost any possible way, you'll get a universe which is either roughly the same or is less fit. That fitness means how many children it produces. In terms of black holes? Yes, because that's the count of the number of children, and again, that's something that can be tested, and it also explains some things. For example, there's the puzzling things about fine-tuning. Why is the universe set up in such a way that there's a lot of carbon and oxygen? And some people say, well, that's because of life, and that's the anthropic principle. But here's another explanation. It turns out that in our universe, most black holes are produced from 
supernova explosions for very massive stars. And it turns out that to form a lot of massive stars in our universe, you need a lot of carbon and oxygen. Why? Because you need big clumps of dust to cool down right. sufficiently to make massive stars. So you get an explanation for the observation that there's a lot of carbon and oxygen that doesn't rely on the anthropic principle, on the idea that it's that way because we're here. But a universe that would be populated with large numbers of black holes doesn't necessarily look like our universe. Uh... Now, and here, you know, when I started to think about this, I didn't know much astronomy, and I used this as a, as a guide to learn astronomy. I started to talk to astronomers, because that's what you've said is a question. How come there isn't a way to make a universe which is very different from ours that makes lots of black holes? Right. Now, every time I looked into such a possibility, I found that there was an answer. For example, you can say, why couldn't there have been much more clumps of matter, big clumps of matter very early, so that just without going through stars, they clumped? Those are called primordial black holes. Why couldn't the universe have been set up to make zillions of primordial right, black holes right. at the very beginning? Well, it turns out if you remember the idea of inflation, and you bring in the idea of inflation, that in many models of inflation, a universe which is tuned to be very clumpy doesn't inflate very much. And so you get a lot of clumpiness and a lot of black holes in a much smaller universe. Uh -huh. And in the end, if you do the arithmetic, you get fewer black holes than in our universe. Uh -huh. So there's a list of such arguments that I had to go through, and it was a great education. It took me from an, you know, an abstract thinker about quantum gravity and space and time into the heart of astronomy, into how stars form, what are neutron stars, how do they, why do you get so many neutron stars, so many black holes, all the beautiful non-equilibrium processes of feedback that uh, take place in galaxies that regulate how fast star formation mm -hmm. takes place. It was a beautiful education, and the conclusion that I came to is that I answered all those questions, all those challenges, and was left over with a handful of predictions, of which one of which I mentioned to you. So to me, this idea is still viable. It could easily be disproven. And anytime you just, for example, have to find a neutron star of two times the mass of the sun, and it would be very hard to keep this idea around. And at the very least, it shows something by demonstration that I think is very important, which is that the methodology of biology, of how in biology they explain why these species and not other species, has a lesson for us when we confront the questions of why these laws and not other laws, why these particles and not other particles.